Okay. It's all yours. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, I've never talked to more than six people at one time in my whole life. <laughs> so, there's only six here. There's only six here? That's it. Oh, I'm good. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, uh, thank you, Steve, for that nice introduction. And he, he kind of explained some of the details. The fact that we only really did it for three years, um, at the top fuel part anyway. We were fans of drag racing forever. But um, anyway, we had a wonderful time. And Bakersfield was an important piece of that whole story, um, including the, having the, the good fortune to win the 1966 version of the uh, March meet. Uh, most people agree that 64, 65, 66 was kind of the high point for that whole, for the March meets. I mean, they've all been sensational, but um, anyway, that was, that was quite a joy just to win it. End up with low ET and a new record and blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, backing up a little history, I was born in Los Angeles, and um, my, my older brother started racing a stock class 57 Chevy in 1958, and it was an opportunity for me to go race without having to have any money, which I didn't have. And um, anyway, so I kind of got involved in his program, and it was a good opportunity to find out why does an engine run? You know, and I bought piles of books and studied them and, I mean, the theory of it all, right? And <clears throat> anyway, ultimately, he ends up winning uh, lots and lots of races or events. And he wins the, uh, the first Winter Nationals, which I think was 61, 60 or 61. Um, and then he wandered off and... Uh, I wandered away from drag racing. And uh, anyway, so my ex-partner, uh, Bob Skinner, he and I, we were big fans of drag racing. We'd be the first ones there and the last ones to leave and listen to what everybody said. And then all week long, we'd talk about it while we were working on other projects. And, uh, and we'd talk about all the, the good points, you know, technically, I mean, what's good about this or bad about that, or what should be considered, how teams conducted themselves, how they, you know, you'd see teams that had to figure out whose fault everything was, and pretty soon the team would blow up, the motor was fine, but the, motor, the team would blow up. And uh, anyway, pretty soon we had a pretty good idea of sort of the do's and don'ts of it. And uh, I had started studying nitromethane maybe in 1960. And uh, my study of all that led me to believe that the way nitro was being used was not really the best way to do it. And then I'm thinking, well, that might be true, but how come somebody hasn't already done it if it's so simple? And I couldn't, we couldn't come up with an answer, so we said, well, let's just try it. So we run out of brains and decide we're going to build this dragster. And of course, we don't really know how to build one. Um, but there was a lot of dragster guys around. So we'd go around from garage to garage and ask questions until they'd throw us out. And we'd go to the next garage. And uh, anyway, by and by, we have this dragster. And uh, at first, we had all kinds of uh, grief with it. You know, I mean, trying to just figuring out what we were doing. And it got better and better, and our kind of nitro experiment worked out real well. Pretty soon we had very good reliability, better than anybody, and pretty soon it ran good enough to win. And anyway, it just went on and on, and we had a great time doing that um, with loads of stories. And there's a rather than boring you with too many stories, there's a, some YouTube videos. Uh, Bill Pitts, I don't know if you know who Bill Pitts is, a wonderful human being. Uh, he's determined to capture drag racing history from the, from the 60s. 
And anyway, he ended up making a, a series of videos on the surfers. Um, they're little 15 minute maximum, maybe 14, 13 minute videos. And there's 51 of them on YouTube. Just type in surfers, space, and then any number from one to 51. And you can see a sort of a long, drawn out um, kind of history of the whole thing, which was, it was kind of fun to do. Um, and I'm glad that we did it just because it's kind of written down. Um, this is really an unusual format for me just to stand and talk. Tell us about 66. 66. Tell us about 66. Um, there wasn't anything really special about 56. In 65, I think we won, I'm, I'm sure we did, we won more individual race events than anybody in the country in a top fuel car, with a top fuel car. And, um, but still, when you show up at, at Bakersfield for the March meet, or the US Fuel and Gas Championship, there'd be 100, over 100 top fuel cars from all over the country and the good ones. I mean, it was, and the quickest 64 raced on Saturday and 64 cars is a lot of cars, you know? So there's 32 pairing, you know, 32 pairs in the first round and it just, you race forever till you, the day's over, right? So anyway, we end up winning the first day uh, against the 64 and set a new world record, low ET and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and then we, we sat out Sunday and then raced Sunday's winner, which was the remaining 32 quickest. They raced on Sunday. And James Warren and Roger Colbert won on Sunday. But by this time, um, they're down to just racing with all the parts that Bakersfield racers owned. And the, <laughs> and the Bakersfield folks were, were really unique in that when at a big event like that, the Bakersfield boys would form a circle, like a, the covered wagons, remember how they protect themselves? <laughs> so at the end of the first round, let's say there were, just for talking, there's 15, Bakersfield cars, or 10, or pick a number. Well, half of them are gonna get knocked out, let's say, in the first round. So they enter the circle. So they're the parts supply, and all their crew is the staff, right? The next round, same thing, except for now the circle got bigger, right? So we have the Bakersfield parts department over here. <laughs> and <clears throat> all these people, and I don't have to tell you, I mean, Bakersfield racers are good racers. You know, they come from a farm background, oil field. I mean, these guys work. These are city slickers, right? And so by the end of Sunday, <clears throat> James and Roger, they've got a car where none of the parts fit the other parts. They got the motor out of this car and the blower off of that car and the who knows what, right? <clears throat> and imagine this, there's a little, imagine a cable lift. It's like a, you hook it and you ratchet this little handle and you pick up a motor, right? That cable thing. They tie the cable around the engine. They come around along the side of the car with the cable and then the part that went click, click, click they hooked it to the back of the car and they just went click, click, click and just sucked the motor back against the little tabs that the motor would, hit, would normally hit where there were no bolt holes, right? And that's all that's holding the motor in, that and gravity, right? And they roll up to the starting line. No big deal. <laughs> Bakersfield Incorporated is here to race, right? <laughs> And the, you know, throughout the year, you'd see lots of incidents at the track. And the Bakersfield boys, they might fuss and feud a little bit amongst themselves. 
But when it came to a big race, they would cooperate. And it, it was really a treat. Um, none of the rest of us had enough sense or community to do that. Where the Bakersfield boys, I think they saw themselves as being um, on an island, you know, I mean, they're not an island, but they're from a different area, you know, even though it's only 100 miles from LA. <clears throat> um, anybody else got any kind of questions? <laughs> There's somebody waving something. Montana and the cardboard. Oh, well, that's a good one. Um, yeah, Tom, tell them about the, the episode in between rounds when you had lost a piston and had to re, you know, change one, or not change one, but take one out. Tell them that episode. Well, that that's the cardboard famous. one. There. Okay, the cardboard. So we're at Fond uh, Fontana, and it's a night race. And so um, we're going along, and j the next to the last round, all of a sudden, one of the connecting rods breaks and jumps out the side and takes a big chunk of the block with it, right? And, oh dear, this is terrible. And so we were going to push it on the trailer, and some of the other guys said, well, wait a minute. Look, you know, we're already out of competition. We'll just take parts off of our car, and look, we'll help you. Oh, uh, no, and then another crew said the same thing, we said, okay, let's do it. So we rolled the car up on its side because the only way we could clean this big missing chunk of metal, enough where we could get tape and cardboard to stick would be to get it up and then wash it down with acetone. Because we always carried a gallon of acetone, right? So we do that. And now we got about 50 or 100 people helping us. There's a sea of humanity around this, right? <clears throat> and our, before we even started, we went and we got Bob, uh, Jim Brissett. And if you guys remember Brissett, uh, he probably blew up more good parts <laughs> than this room could hold. <laughs> I mean, he knew all about blowing stuff up and fixing it. So, we went and got him before we even started and said, Brissette, you got to come and be the supervisor. So he shows up and um, we just get after it, us and 50 or 100 people. And we put, um, we pounded the, the piston, the rod broke up real high right up by the, connect, uh, by the piston. So we took, uh, some pry bars or something, we went in there and boogered the cylinder up so the piston wouldn't drop down. We put a hose clamp and tape and stuff around the crankshaft so the oil wouldn't jump out, you know, the oil pressure. Taped her all up, got the pan off of somebody else's car, flopped it down on its wheels and filled it up with 98% and off we went. And we didn't change anything so that it would get a, a bigger dose of air and fuel for the remaining seven cylinders. She ran pretty good till about 900 foot. <laughs> Boom, it all came out the bottom and that was the end of that one. That was, a, that was a fun one. There's three pictures that exist of that um, repair. So, <coughs> um, it's been easy to tell the story because there's some, actually some proof. Because most people, they hear that and they go, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, we've heard your story before, you know. Anybody else got anything I could talk about? No? So, why was the race car so short? It was 150 wheelbase, 150 inch wheelbase, is that right? No, it started at 100 and, I'm gonna say 120. Um, it started because that was what the current cars had. And then each time we messed it up and put a new front half on it, they call it new front half, um, we'd make it a little bit longer, like whatever was current. And then we got to the point where the garage wasn't any longer. And on the back of the car, there's a bar that, a rod that sticks out that comes against the push bar on the, Car, right? Well, that thing, when we would back it in the garage, 
it made a hole in the wall. And so this is at the Red Apple Motel in Santa Monica, Wilshire Boulevard, right? And it came through the, this hole from the, our garage, came out between a Coke machine and a water faucet <laughs> on the other side, right? And so here's this chrome thing sticking through with light coming around it. And the, the, the guests at the motel, they would look at that and they'd hear mumbling and talking and, and then they couldn't stand it anymore. They'd walk around to the alley and just, here we are, working on this dragster in the middle of this motel, right? <clears throat> and Bob Skinner's mother ran the place. Um, his, Bob Skinner's parents came out here from West Texas in oh, late 30s, 38, 39, something like that. And uh, his mom ended up running this motel from 42 to 78, something like that. And uh, just a sweetheart, just a great, great person. Um, and she made sure that we could operate, I mean, take care of our dragster in the middle of a motel. It was kind of an unusual motel because there was an alley that went through it, the old part and the new part. And, uh, and then the room above, or rooms above our garage were the last ones to get rented. And so if she had to fill them up, she'd finally go, okay, keep it really quiet tonight, right? Good enough. And you didn't argue with Mrs. Skinner. That was not a good plan. Um, oh, yeah, that, that covers the wheelbase thing, huh? But anyway, we could still keep the, get the garage door to close. Um, we got a, a bunch of scrapes at that motel. Not bad ones, but one time, uh, I've got the rear end, the axle housing out of the car, and I've got it on, clamped to a big post that holds up the second floor. And I've got it turned bright red with a torch, and I'm trying to straighten it a little bit. And Bob Skinner's outside, and we got the frame hanging off the, oh, the little sewer clean-out fittings. And he's spraying it with lacquer, right? And here comes the assistant fire chief down the alley. And he sees me with the torch, Skinner with the, uh, the lacquer spray gun, and he freaks out. And it's going to be the end of the world, and they're going to throw a lock on this place. And uh, we thought, oh boy, we're done now. And then the problem just went away. And years later, we found out that the uh, motels end up with uh, a lot of the patrons become very indebted to the, the innkeeper over different things that happen in motels. And, and it turned out that the fire chief owed a big debt to Mrs. Skinner. <laughs> And, and so anyway, magically a problem went away and Skinner and I, we thought we were doomed, you know. That was a good one. Um, anybody got a, something else? Tom, when, when you guys quit, did you say you could only make so much money in that, like in San Fernando, you, if you couldn't make the thing at least break even? What was that figure? I think Bob Skinner was, a, was a, a magician at many things. One of them was keeping the books, which mostly happened to his, in his head. And he had little scraps of paper he put in his pocket. And so he could, at any point, you could say, Bob, what's it costing us per run to run this car? And he'd go, mm. and when we got to the point where it was, I think, $56 per run, I mean like our overall complete cost. That includes paying the driver, everything, right? Um, and at San Fernando, you had, if you won, you got what, 250? And you had to make how many runs for that? Including the qualifier? So you had to make four passes. So um, if you divide four into the 25, it's 60 something 
So that whatever number I asked Bob, it was a buck more than what, if you divide, you had to win the event to lose money. <laughs> and, and that was the end of us in San Fernando. <laughs> and San Fernando was a wonderful place to race. We saw this guy right here growing up there. He, he worked the pit gate when he was 14 um, and was nice to all of us. He could have thrown us all out, you know, if he wanted to. And his brother, Sky, Dave Wallace, Sky Wallace, and Dave Sr., their father worked there too. All great people. Um, anyway, Skinner was a magic, magic guy. I don't, he's really hard to describe because I've never seen anybody like him before or since. And uh, how he could do that and tell me what, how much is this costing us per run? It would take him 10 seconds, 20 seconds, then he'd just give you a number. There you go. Um, what else have we got? Anything? One time you told me. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Uh, you, your secret was atomizing the nitro to a fine spray. That's our. And, uh, and you made no, you had no real sponsors. Uh, they had to come from winnings. You had to race off winnings. Is that true? Uh, that's absolutely true, Ed. Iskandarian. <laughs> uh, how about that? <laughs> how about our pal Ed? 97 years old. Huh? <laughs> and it, it must have been 10 years ago that he and I were talking about this and he can just, bam. <laughs> He can still call you on it, right? <laughs> um, no, Ed, you're, you're exactly right. Um, we were using maybe 200 pounds of fuel pressure when others were using maybe 60, but you couldn't see that from the outside. Um, when I was racing in that stock class with my brother, um, it, it got to be very obvious to me that you didn't want to do anything that was out of the mainstream where the man with the ballpoint pen could put an X through you and or your kind of car. Remember people had two engines and three engines and you know if one of those combinations had have just dominated somebody would have got out the ballpoint pen and there would have been an X through two engine cars right or three engine or whatever you know, you could put the engines in upside down and backwards, and if that was an advantage, they'd just put an X through it. So anyway, we made our dragster so it was just like everybody else's, and then tried to have our advantage not show in any way that anybody could figure out. And yet, you know, people knew there was a difference because the car sounded different. And that was generally acknowledged by everyone. Um, but they couldn't figure out why. And um, anyway, a key piece of that was the atomizing of the fuel. And nowadays they're probably using a thousand. I don't know, you can't get anybody to give you a straight answer, but maybe a thousand PSI, 800. But that might be just simply to deliver that volume of fuel. I mean, you can't do that at 50 pounds or 100 pounds. What did it take to get the pressure up to 200 pounds. Just make the nozzles smaller, make the return jet smaller. Does it have to uh, tighten up the clearances in the pump? No, huh? No, that Tuthill style pump, when they use them for hydraulic tracers on a lathe, those things made a thousand pounds PSI all day long. Of course they were pumping oil, but anyway, the pump had no problem with it at all. You just have to restrict it more. I think you, we better take our technical discussion <laughs> offline before the uh, lynch mob forums here. <laughs> I'll be in a world of hurt then. I can't run very good. Anybody else got any? Go for it. The deal about buying fuel. 
getting in the back of your shop. <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> um, have you seen the picture with the Volkswagen bug? Yes. So one day I'm in Long Beach, and Mickey Thompson had a, most of his businesses were down there, and he had a speed shop, right? I'm sure you, a lot of you probably went there. And they sold fuel. And it was usually, very often it was the best deal in town that we could get in on. Some people had connections, printing, you know, printing company connections. Anyway, we didn't have any of that. So we'd buy it from Mickey Thompson. And so I was going to, uh, all during this period that we raced our dragster, I'm going to Santa Monica City College uh, with a full schedule, right? And, and had a part-time job. And then in between, I chased parts, right? And so I had my Volkswagen Bug, and I'm in Long Beach, and we needed a drum of nitro. So I went over to the speed shop, and this guy, remember Jack Yule? He used to race a... Jack Yule. Jack Yule raced the fuel dragster. He drove it, too. Um, Jack was in charge of the speed shop. And so I says, hey, Jack, I need a, a drum of nitro. OK. He says, why don't you pull around back, and we'll load you up. I said, OK. So I pull my Volkswagen around back, and he comes out and goes, whoa, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> and I said, no, nah, this won't be any problem. So I, I took the seat out of the seat track. Remember, they would just slide out, threw it in the back. And we got an empty nitro drum, put it in there, and we put the label outward so you could see it. And then he just filled it. They had a, like a gas pump. <laughs> they filled the barrel, and the door wouldn't close, so we taped it. <laughs> a little bit. And down the freeway I go, right? <laughs> and the people, you know, people see this act, the door isn't closed and the tape, and they pull up alongside and they look, and pretty soon they're looking at this label, and it's got, you know, Peligro, uh, <laughs> you know, this is bad, right? And all of a sudden, they just disappear. And then you go a little further and somebody pulls up and they, ooh, they disappear. And anyway, I get home and we, um, we had an old tire, just a tire off of a rim, just with nothing, you know, no, you know, just a blank tire. We laid it on the ground and we just pushed the drum out on the tire, right? And remember Volkswagen had a little cheesy running board? Well, that left. And from then on, there was just no more running board and then there was no more problem. And anyway, there's a picture of that which saves the day because if you, uh, if you tell somebody that story, they go, yeah, yeah, come on, you know. But we got a picture that shows Jack Yule filling her up. It was great. Anybody else? Hey, thanks for helping me, everybody, on this deal. <laughs> um, <coughs> I guess that's it. Thank you, Mike. 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 Thank in this age that we're in now, with the multi-million dollar teams and what's going on, and Tom Job had pursued this sport all the way to this time, there's only there's no telling what he would have accomplished. And I just think that, again, when you think of three years, because all those guys did it and left a lasting legacy. I mean, I was fortunate enough to see history. This guy made history. So once again, Tom, thank you so much. Enjoy the races. Let's keep this legacy going. Uh, 
is a great group. Thank you very much. Okay, do you think that fine spray will help today in top view? The what? Fine well, spray. Oh, hell yeah. Atomization. Oh, hell yeah. Great. Yeah. Can you, you know, like a, a modern diesel's yeah, got, what, 30,000? Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, that's what they're doing. High so pressures and all that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they do 